Hey guys, welcome back. At this point, I know you've heard all kinds of great things about the stock market and how it's this amazing wealth creating tool, but how does it really work? Could you lose your hard earned money? Let's get into it. In this video, we will go over stock market basics, how you make money in the stock market and different types of investment vehicles. We'll start by defining the terms stock market. A market is where you buy and sell goods. In this case, you buy and sell stocks. A company stock is just another word for a company's value and the value is divided up into shares. You can imagine a pie that represents the value or stock of a company. The pie is divided into many small slices and these shares of stock are then traded on the market. If you bought half of the slices, you would own half of the company. Most of the largest companies in the world are publicly traded on the stock market and you will have access to buy a small share of their stock. So the stock market is a place where you can buy and sell companies, but you can't just hit up Elon Musk and ask to buy a share of Tesla. You have to buy and sell your shares through a broker, which is simply a middleman for the transaction. Common stock brokers in the US include Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, or Vanguard. You simply go to their website, set up an account, and deposit some money. Now let's get into why you might want to do that. A publicly traded company literally has one function above all others, maximize profit for the owners of the company, the owners being the shareholders. If you buy the stock, then you are a shareholder. Legally, this is true. If the directors or executives of a publicly traded company are shown to go against that legal duty known as a fiduciary responsibility, they'll get sued. Additionally, shareholders have voting power over the directors and could vote them out of their position. So legally, the people who control the company are doing everything in their power to put money in your pocket. Now, there are generally two ways that a company can return value to you, a stock shareholder, and we will talk about each in detail. Number one is dividends. This one is very intuitive. After a company pays all of its employees and expenses and replaces its inventory or equipment, any revenue left over is profit, and that can be passed on to its shareholders. This sum of money paid to shareholders out of a company's profits is called a dividend payment. In most cases, a company will pay a set amount every quarter. One metric that most investors will look at when analyzing a dividend paying stock is by looking at its dividend yield. This just means the percentage of the share price that gets paid out in a single year. So if a share of a company stock is worth $100 and it pays $2.50 per quarter, then it pays $10 per year and that would be a 10% dividend yield. Now that would be a very high dividend yield. The average dividend yield is probably somewhere between one and 3% for most companies. Now there is a lot more that goes into analyzing a dividend stock, easily enough to have its own video. Let me know if the comments, if that's something you're interested in. Okay, so the more profitable a company is, the more it can pay its shareholders. And the more a company pays its shareholders, typically the more a single share will be worth. This brings us to the second way you can make money by owning a stock, and that is through value appreciation. Let's say the going rate for a single share of company X is $100, and every year you get paid $5 in dividends. You could say that's 5% dividend. After a few years, the company is able to do more business, and they announce that they will now pay $10 per year, a 10% dividend. Assuming nothing else is wrong with the company, if you and the rest of the market were willing to invest $100 to get $5 in return before, the same ratio would hold true. The company would increase in value so that a single share now costs $200, which would restore the old dividend percentage of 5%. This is great news for you though, because you bought the share for $100 and now you can sell them for $200. Pretty straightforward. But what if a company never pays you a dividend? Why would anyone want to buy a stock that never pays them? It's a good question. The answer is the potential for greater profits in the future. Imagine a company that is primed for amazing growth. They have a market that is begging for their product, but they just don't have the equipment or space or whatever to deliver that product. They are profitable now, but if they hold back on paying a dividend this year, they can use that profit to expand into another market and make way more money the next year. If this scenario of increased profits seems likely to the public, then the stock price will go up in anticipation. Now you can sell that stock for more money than you bought it without ever being paid by the company. Of course, it doesn't always pan out this way. And just like with dividend companies, there are tons of nuances to analyzing growth stocks. 
Now, even with a growth stock, at a certain point, growth will slow down. Eventually, spending money on trying to grow doesn't result in much more future profit. You could say the dollars you use on growing the company are not used efficiently anymore. Imagine someone told you, this dollar is yours, but if you let me keep it, I'll turn it into one dollar and one cent in five years. You'd be like, no thanks, I'll just take my dollar now. Once this situation happens for a publicly traded company, they start to pay a dividend. Okay, so from these two different modes of profit, a sort of pattern emerges. Companies that don't pay a dividend are typically younger companies trying to grow, while companies that do pay a dividend are typically mature companies that are already very established in their market. And yes, there are loads of exceptions to this rule, but I think it's a good starting point. If you've made it this far, you must be enjoying the video. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. It helps with the algorithm, which really helps me out. I would really appreciate it. All right, so even with your newfound knowledge of the stock market, picking a company that you want to invest in is still a daunting task. Some companies fail after all, so there's no guarantee that the one you select will make money. The solution to this problem is investing in a fund. There are two basic types of funds, actively managed funds and passively managed funds. An actively managed fund is also known as a hedge fund. It is run by a team of professional investors. You give them your money and they take it from there, picking companies that, according to their research and expertise, they believe will outperform the rest of the market. They also seek to time the market, to sell when it's high and buy when it's low. This sounds great in theory, but not all active managers are created equal. It is very difficult to find the ones that are actually skilled. If you just pick one that's doing well at the time, it's possible they were just on a lucky streak that's about to reverse. On top of that, their services are not free. Generally, you are charged a small percentage every year whether your investment goes up or down. This yearly fee deceptively adds up quite a bit over many years. Interestingly, one of the greatest and most famous active fund managers of all time, Warren Buffett, issued a challenge in 2008 to the hedge fund industry, specifically the funds that charged exorbitant fees, that over the next decade, actively managed funds would lose to a passively managed fund, the S&P 500, after you account for the differences in fees. Buffett was so confident that he put $1 million on the line and a company accepted, Protege Partners LLC, the hedge fund. Here's the result. As you can see, the passively traded fund crushed in this case. The five actively managed funds selected by Protege Partners LLC had on average a cumulative return of just 22% compared to the S&P's 85%. So let's talk about passively traded funds. The most common example is an index fund, which seeks to track a predetermined financial market index. The S&P 500 is a prime example. The S&P 500 invests in the 500 largest U.S. companies and is weighted by market capitalization, which just means proportionally, the bigger the company, the higher percentage of the fund. For instance, the largest company in the U.S. at this time is Apple, and it makes up 7.03% of the S&P 500, while the 300th largest company is Ulta, and it makes up just 0.06%. This is considered a passive fund because the managers don't need to make any decisions on what to buy or when to buy it. They just observe the market and follow the predetermined rules of the index fund. A passive fund does not need to do heavy market research or hire experts to time the market so it can afford to have much lower fees. Again, using the S&P 500 as an example, the annual fee percentage is just 0.03%. If you invest in Vanguard's fund, which has a symbol of VOO, compare this to the typical actively managed fund, which averages between half a percent to 1%. That doesn't seem like a huge difference, but let's do some math. Let's say you plan to invest $10,000 over 30 years. And let's assume you get an average annualized return of 10% over that period for both an actively managed fund and a passively managed fund. With the passively managed fund, you have a fee of 0.03% over 30 years at a 10% return, you end up with $163,000. Now, when you have a 1% fee and you invest that same amount of money over 30 years with the same return, it doesn't seem like that much of a difference, but you end up with $123,000. That means you would be paying about 40K on your 10K investment over a 30 year period. As you can see, even a small percentage can add up to a significant amount of money over a long period of time, which 
If you are investing properly, you should be investing over a long period of time. It really is hard to go wrong with a quality index fund like the S&P 500 if you invest and stay invested over many years. With the 500 largest companies in the U.S., this fund does a great job tracking the U.S. economy. As long as the economy is doing well, your investments will be doing well. It's kind of like the whole country is working for you. With this video, you will be well equipped to succeed in the stock market. Remember, the best time to start investing for you was 10 years ago. If you missed it, the second best time is right now. If you enjoyed the video and you want to see more information on how your money can work for you, please be sure to check out this video on what the rich don't tell you about money. Till next time.